Hey everybody, thanks for bear with, bearing with us there for a minute. Um, that's all on me. Um, I had uh, internet fun right at the last moment, so appreciate everybody's patience. Um, I'm John Marchant from Kippatai, um, and uh, we've got my business partner and colleague Fernando, um, and we've got uh, Mikhail Lubchansky, um, who I'm sure a lot of you will know. Um, he's surrounded by his creations there on screen. And oh, look at the perfectly cued. Uh, we've got Jared from Red with us as well. Um, yes. So yeah, yeah. Um, I know this is going to be um, probably what everybody uh, wants to know. So I'm going to ping it at Jared first of all, which is uh, everybody wants their camera yesterday. Um, <laughs> <laughs> how how well, things? Oh, well, my inbox agrees the, with me. What, Yeah. Um, so how, much, how much time do, do we do you want the short answer or the long answer? I don't know how much time you guys have. Well, well I know it's complex, but yeah, it's, it, is, um, it is complicated. Yeah. And so on the, I mean, you guys with the, the colored cameras are obviously a little bit special in a special group. And I created this, if we back up a little bit, the colored cameras were um as we entered the lockdown and the komodos were actually pretty close to entering that stormtrooper phase but then the factory closed down and the engineers and everybody had to kind of figure out how to keep working but work from home um which we adapted amazingly well and the, the these colored cameras cost probably six or seven times more than we sold them for but the feedback from them and your guys testing them is worth it times a hundred. Um, and the engineers hate it. I mean, the business folks hate it. They hate, they're like, what do you mean we're sending cameras out to normal people? And I, you know, I was like, trust me, the feedback and the testing we get from real people, real shooters taking their own cameras, not just, you know, loaners from red or some kind of weird beta program when it's their camera and they get to do whatever the hell they want with it, the feedback that we get is going to be worth months of pretending to test in a lab. And it proved to be exactly that. You guys nailed and hammered on these cameras right out of the gate. Uh, so that was great. Uh, and then we, meanwhile, while that was all happening, we entered phase two of our reopening after the virus and that let a little bit more people back in manufacturing in our facility in Southern California uh, and gave us a little window of an opportunity to make that decision, which happened last week of do we continue with the colored cameras or do we have this window now that for us the next phase when our factory is allowed to reopen completely happens next week after the july 4th holiday so far um do we take that because what the other thing that's happening as we had this kind of good news everything's we're on top of the virus i mean it's still there but people are behaving and the numbers are going down all of a sudden they started to spike again. So if last week was really a, a kind of come to Jesus moment of, wow, holy shit, we have the opportunity or the challenge of there might be another lockdown here if the numbers seem to grow. So do we take it slow or do we, once our factory opens, just get in and start making these stormtroopers as fast as we can because the feedback from you guys, again, this, that couldn't have happened without you guys banging on all these colored cameras, all the, the, and I think you saw it from lots of you have had a few builds along the way. Mikhail, thank you very much. I mean, this guy's a machine. He's putting out builds every day, almost. Uh, we were at a point engineer wise where, yeah, we can do it. We probably, I mean, there's a lot of risk associated, but let's, we can do it if that's the right decision. And I didn't know, you know, I, this isn't the first time we usually do a stormtrooper program, you know, yeah. a white camera program um, to kind of get out. And this is before we release specs, before it even, you go to red.com right now and you don't even know what a Komodo is. 
So this is kind of just something I've, uh, I've always done because I know how valuable it is. And I started this little email list and which has grown just off the chart. But um, so on the weekend I said, okay, let's do it. Let's go stormtrooper all the way. And so this week into next week, as we prep the factory, uh, and I have Clark who works with me at the studio here in stage four. Uh, he's going to get everybody's information. I know, I mean, people are emailing like crazy and it's taken us a while to get back to everybody, but this week is kind of the week to communicate, get everybody their spot locked in. And then the following week is when we start, we're just starting a full onslaught of building these stormtroopers and it's really cool it feels like since it's since this is a studio only this program this entire colored and this this white program really is just happening out of the studio with my i have about 12 people here um it feels like the red one days again you know it feels like we just have no idea what we're doing it's a total cluster i probably shouldn't i should probably stop swearing so much but um, it's a very, not it's a very seat of the <laughs> seat of the pants, <laughs> uh, program we have, but it feels really special. And so to answer your question, the long winded way, uh, they'll start to go out between if all goes well, probably between not next week, but the following week after that into the following weeks after that. The list is getting pretty long, as you can imagine. So it'll just be people getting their space queue in line and then, you know, making them as fast as we can and then shipping them out. Um, and then just hoping we'll make as many as we can until either the list gets fulfilled or we get shut down again. So kind of the answer to that. Yeah, it's it's complex. I know it, it's yeah, uh, it is very. We, we see a, a very small amount of it. Obviously, you know, making products ourselves on a, a you know very different scale. Um, but even on that scale, yeah, we've been doing the same thing. We're you know making stuff in my own workshop. We've got people working from home, um, taking complex and expensive tooling with them to try and make stuff happen. Um, yeah. you know, literally in the in the garage. So. Yeah, it's it's a challenge, um, but I guess like you say, it, it, you know, getting stuff out there, getting feedback early uh, before we get to um, you know uh, the production cameras, the black cameras. Um, you know, it's it's got to be worth it for you guys, and it's I think for a lot of people um, who aren't necessarily taking ownership of the camera, um, being on the sidelines and getting to see stuff, if they're serious there's valuable information coming for them as well. It's not just the benefit that they get further down the line. It's that they get to see a little bit of well-filtered, well-thought-out information. Now, yeah, you know, I don't know about the well, well thought yeah. out, but, <laughs> well, it's, 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 but it's where, uh, you know, it's pretty easy for people to talk crap. So there's a plenty, there's plenty of that too. Um, but I think for the person who knows what they're looking at, yeah, it's valuable. Yeah, no, that's and that's the reality of it. And, and there's something authentic about that. And trust me, I get the same opposition even internally is people, you know, I'm, I'm always been transparent. You know, I always say that we were customers. Jim and I, we started this because we're shooters. You know, we're making this camera for ourselves and just kind of hope everybody likes them as we go along. And I think that it really, the thing in this lockdown, and I was just talking to, Fernando earlier is it was as horrible as it is it was a really awesome opportunity for me to actually go out and start shooting again I mean I've shot more in the last three months than I have in the last three years and that and that's important and that's the other reason for you know the storm again the stormtroopers they're expensive to make these aren't really full production you know factory cameras they're expensive it's not a money thing for us to sell these cameras, but I know that how important it is for everybody in the creative space and as shooters to get out there and shoot or you go crazy. I mean, I was, we were about a week away myself from losing my mind from just kind of being stuck, but being able to, it's the, it's the blessing of being 
a shooter or a filmmaker is you can actually just take a camera and be safe and go shoot something. And there's something really therapeutic as the whole world feels like it's falling apart. And you get to also document what's going on, which is important. It's, it's incredibly important to be able to go and not with just with the pandemic, you know, with, uh, with the protest and everything else that happened in this world, it was really valuable for people to grab a camera and go and to shoot. And that's really one of the most excited, personally, the most exciting parts of this stormtrooper program is if we hit another lockdown, there'll be a lot of people with new cameras in their hands that get to a learn how to shoot it and give them something to do to kind of cope with the current situation. And I think that, um, I think that's important. I really do think that that's important because it's challenging. It's a challenging time. You know, you yeah, got to keep busy. I mean, it's, um, it, it's interesting. I want to throw this over to, uh, to Fernie for a second, because he's been um, uh, working with the camera a fair bit. And there's a, a couple of uh, bits of material which we've been able to, to share with people. Um, you know, this is a camera that you can actually pick up and go and shoot in that kind of difficult environment. And, you know, it has been difficult for a lot of different reasons to shoot, not least because you're having to work in a very limited way. Um, you know, if you if this was the red one that you just brought out right at this moment in this scenario, you know, we wouldn't be able to pick it up, grab it and just go and do. Um, it's a physically a totally different proposition. Um, Fernie, what, um, just tell us a bit about um, the, the shoot you did up in London, um, just in terms of um, quantity of crew, how you kind of um, loaded out, how you packed out to, to go and do that. Yeah, so um, I was just sort of talking to Jared earlier. Um, I've never been so excited about the, the camera since the release of the Red One uh, uh, with the Komodo um, coming out. Um, and the, the biggest, um, you know, the biggest sell point for me is is the is the small form factor, um, the, the the low power consumption, the fact that you can just grab it, um, you know, in ten minutes you, you can just shoot at the at the house, at the office, and just go and shoot something, um, whether it's a, a riot or a documentary or, or just something very quickly off the fly where, you know, we we've we've got monstros, Gemini's, Helium's here. At, at, at the office, but uh, the the go-to camera, I'll always be picking up the, the Komodo as a self-shooter. Um, I'll be shooting 10 times more on this camera than I will be on any other camera. And that's not, not saying that any other camera is inferior, nowhere near inferior to this, but um, it's just the accessibility uh, of the camera. Um, and together with the, uh, the revolver, which we've got on here, so the internal MD, it's just such a quick, quick run and gun camera to work with. So the shoot up in London, and uh, normally if I shoot on something like, you know, a, a typically on a, on a Gemini, I'd, I'd at least have three or four crew with me um, to shoot something like that. I, I shot it um, with myself and Bryce, who was just carrying a, a tripod for me, bless him. But um, I mean, I had it all in a, in a low pro bag like this. Um, batteries, lenses um ef lenses uh two mounts <laughs> so uh, an rf to canon mount uh, um an rf to, to pl had a couple of supremes um three sigma art lenses um media all in one backpack so i, I if, you know and, and the card reader and my laptop so i could <laughs> i only had two cards with me so i could back up the media as i went um because it was just so easy it's just on the fly and um you're a, you know, a studio I'm, in a backpack there really aren't you basically i was <laughs> ditching shooting <laughs> um, it, it yeah. makes and that stuff was phenomenal it was so and that's another thing that i love you know when we when we would release cameras before and especially when we used to do, do the whole nab circus thing you know, it was shoot this big, crazy, expensive feature film looking test footage and blow it out there and get everybody excited. 
And I changed that. I started changing that a few years ago because it's, uh, it's not really real. I mean, the camera, all of our cameras are capable of taking phenomenal footage. If you, if you give the red one today to somebody incredibly, I mean, look at, you know, social network. Um, you give that camera to somebody talented, they can take a pretty image. So I like the idea of, again, give, making these cameras available to people in the test phase with all, their, with all the ugliness and the image anomalies and the weird stuff going on. Again, because when we get that feedback and see how people shoot, it helps us lock in. We, weren't, we, weren't, we didn't decide on the black point for Komodo until last Friday. So you get to see this and you know, a lot of people, when you guys posted that footage, I had no idea. It's not like I'm sitting <laughs> here, you know, everybody, you have to sign NDAs and don't release shitty looking footage or great looking footage. I've got to prove everything which most companies do, oh, yeah. uh, you know, that I saw that stuff come out when everybody else did. And the good and the bad, there's no kind of controlling that because that's real life. As you learn, especially it's a new camera and you get this camera and you have to learn how to use it. And I did a few things on the Komodo where your exposure, I added, I created this different kind of goalpost um, method of of judging highlights and stuff mm. that you have to get used to you know you have to learn how to use it so am i blowing out am i not um what's the exposure range and it's a new tool that you have to learn and i like to share that with the world because a lot of people are so excited about this camera i like to share that process with people because it's educating and they learn okay wow that footage is all blown out. Why is that stuff all blown out? Is there something wrong with the camera? Well, there kind of was at one point because we had, we were still working on where do we put the middle point? Um, but also it's like, oh shit, I didn't realize that this is how I'm supposed to read the exposure meters now because they're new. And oh, I didn't know that my monitor has a LUT now because it's not a red monitor and everybody's monitor, you know, you're using a small HD, you're using whatever other monitor you might have, the porta keys, the, there's a bunch of great little ones, they all look differently. And you just kind of have to learn that. And I like bringing along everybody for the ride, even though you're going to get a ton of people saying, what the hell is wrong with you guys? And why are you doing this? Um, I think that's the way that as we are a community-based company, it's better for everybody to experience and just witness. And if you don't like it, just close your eyes officially Komodo doesn't officially exist i mean if you call 1-800 red they'll be like i don't know jared's just doing his thing up at the studio just go go email him or talk to him uh so if you don't like watching it then just close your eyes and wait for the black cameras to come out and there'll be you know a bunch of pretty images and specs and everything else you need to to, to know but this is this is just you know it really is a part of me and it just like it was a part of Jim, and I just like doing it. And I don't care if people don't like it and if people get upset. By it. Really, <laughs> uh, that's good. I mean, the thing is, you, you talk about it as a as a. Uh oh. It's a huge part of. Uh, oh, we got him back. Oh, you got me. Sorry, guys. Um, Rep repeat okay, that last. Yeah. So you're saying community is a, a big deal. Um, and you know a part of that is um evident with the people from the community who kind of come into the fold like we have like mikhail has as, as well you know we start out as users and we get involved and we get more involved and you know and we we you know, end up in a lot of cases working hand in hand um yeah. i mean Mikhail, what's uh, i don't know if a lot of people necessarily know uh, they're i think they're aware of your app um, do you want to just give us a, you know, the briefest kind of version of your um, journey to, to where you are now? Because um, I think it, you know, people might easily just assume, oh, he's a coder, he's a, he's a programmer. <laughs> no, <laughs> which, I, which I'm not, yeah. I was just like making very like six years ago or something, or maybe uh, 
I start with the red one. I got a red one and the, the workflow was so primitive at the time. So I had to kind of do my own small Apple script and stuff just to be, <clears throat> be able to uh, go from Final Cut back to uh, Red Cine and do the, the very early, early stuff at the beginning when there was no XML uh, import and we just had to rely on the EDL. And I was like transforming the names of the, uh, the clips back to the uh, red name that was longer than what the EDL at the time could save inside the the file, which was very, very primitive. So I did a, a first Apple script just to be able to do this and put them on Red User. And then people started downloading them and finishing their film with the, the script. So I did another one just, just for, for me. And then suddenly when I think the Dragon came out or maybe it was the uh, Epic X or something, I was using a small app that was making like PDF catalogs with uh, just one thumbnail from the clips. And this didn't work with the new sensor and the guy making this app was like doing something else. So I said, okay, I'll do it myself. So I started putting and looking at the, the red SDK, which was like Chinese to me at the time. I was just like, <laughs> I won't be able to decode anything, but I just spent like the, the few hours on this and then understood how I was able to decode a file and make a thumbnail and put it there and with the metadata with red line and put it also in the PDF and did that app called Full Cat that lets you catalog your uh, day of shoot and being able to refer to uh, the best clip that you've got on that day without going through all the rushes. And again, put that online with a PayPal link and people started buying the app and using it. And on set they say, oh, I look good now on set because I got your PDF and everyone loves it. And I give it to the producer, to the script supervisor or to the client. And they hire me again because I had this uh, <laughs> PDF that no one else had. And uh, I was happy with that and was like, just making like pocket money and something and like Six years ago, Jared saw it on a big uh, shoot with uh, Dino that's showing the app. And then he shoot me an email and say, oh, I love what you did. You should come to NAB and show your software there. And by the way, we have a new SDK that will be coming out uh, at NAB for guys like you. And I thought Jared maybe thought I was a real developer or at a company or something, which was <laughs> obviously not the case. It was just me doing like... Uh, small coding on my end. And since he gave me the SDK before everyone else and I had this camera on my desk and the cable, I started like saying everyone, no, don't disturb me. I'll be busy in the next few weeks. And I just dived in and did this uh, UI to be able to put all the um, this setting that was in the camera at the time. And there was a long list of settings, but I thought that this one needed to be there. And this one I don't need because I'm not using that in the uh, but I'm shooting, so I was able to kind of uh, reshuffle all the uh, features that were in the camera and put it into a different UI. And since I'm a user and not an engineer, uh, suddenly it was like an easy thing to uh, to use for people, and and it really catched up very quickly. I was surprised. I thought it would be just a one. <laughs> one thing that I do and like a few months later, someone else would do a better app or whatever, but then people just email me and say, oh, it's good on the computer, but I need the same thing on my phone. And then and then the next summer I started doing the app for the iPhone and then Red released some Wi-Fi uh, enabled camera and then it went crazy after that. Yeah. So the, um, the big transition now um, is, um, what we're, what we're looking at is not full control. This is red control, um, but yeah. You know, so it's full yeah. control. <laughs> Just call it. it. We we know what it is. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Make uh, no mistake about it. We have nothing to do with it. This is all Mikhail. Yeah. You know, we just have to change the name a little bit. But I will always call it full control. And um, and I don't want to. I don't want to de-emphasize how critical that that moment that Mikhail has. It's actually, this is the perfect group because you both were part of that initial. But I remember seeing what Mikhail was doing on, it was on that, I think it was Mordecai, some big Johnny Depp movie, 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 Hill's massive crew and there's Dino in his, and I don't know if he, everybody knows Dino, but he is the DIT of all DITs. He's got like eight carts around him, air conditioning in his, his little DIT village. And he just is the guy that kind of always figures stuff out really early. And he showed me what Mikhail was doing. 
And at the time we had our own little version and there was one of the biggest faults we had at, at Red at the beginning of our company was we tried to do everything ourselves because when we first were developing the Red One, nobody would talk to us. Everybody thought we were out of our mind and no, we're not gonna help you, good luck. You guys are nuts. And what do you know about cameras, blah, 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 blah. So we kind of had this thing ingrained, oh my God, we're gonna have to do everything ourselves. We're gonna have to make our sensors, our ASICs, our software on both in the camera, the firmware, and the software to decode, the red rocket, da, 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 da. So we had this mentality of we have to do this all ourselves, not because we were going to be better than everybody, but just because nobody would help us. And of course, there was that moment where I saw what Mikhail was doing and, and we were working on something kind of similar, which was no, and trust me, a team of engineers was working on this. And I'm like, wow, this one guy is doing, who is a shooter, you know, Dino gave me the background that he knew of Mikhail. Um, one guy doing this for the right reason. It's not to get rich and it's not to, you know, take over the world. It was, he's a shooter and needs a tool. That's, that's why we started Red. So that I literally went, once Dino showed me that, and this was, this must have been two o'clock in the morning. I went out to a U-Haul truck, a big box truck in on set. I called Brent Carter, who's over here right now. Um, I called Brent Carter and a few other people. And I'm like, we have to let the third parties in and we have to let people start this, start helping us with this stuff. And literally that moment that night was when the third party program began. And that's when I called you, John. And of course, Mikhail was already there. And um, I think we had Frame IO before it was Frame IO. Uh, but we started to embrace the community to do exactly what we were doing. And, you know, it really was an important transition in our company where we realized, wow, other people can obviously do this better than us, but it keeps it in the community. And we all learn, I mean, the, with what you, with the revolver and, and the filters and all the stuff you guys did at Kipper tie, if we tried to do this ourselves, same with, Pool control, Komodo would be, not to mention the previous cameras, but Komodo would be another six months out because, and we'd probably do it wrong. <laughs> you know, <laughs> we do a lot of stuff wrong. And uh, so it helps. It helps us, it helps you, and it helps the customer and the shooter, which ultimately is the goal. And hopefully we all can survive and make a little money off of doing so. Um, but it really feels like we're all in this together, which is super cool to me. Yeah, I think um, Komodo <laughs> is like a, a, another step on in that evolution um, in terms of how streamlined you guys are being. Um, you know, I know there are a few people who have been asking me, you know, will this accessory I've got, this other accessory that I've got from DSMC2, is it gonna work? And to a degree, it feels like it's a bit of a harsh cut off but in another way, it does represent that focus of saying, okay, we're going to do what we're good at doing um, yep. and let other people do what they're good at doing. I mean, Absolutely correct. I mean, does, that, <laughs> um, does, it, um, does it concern you at all in terms of the, um, uh, the ability to share or not share some of that stuff from uh, the DSMC2 line? Or is, it, is your philosophy more about it being like a parallel companion thing? Yeah, this is, so this is part of, and you know, before RAD, I worked with uh, Vision Research and Panasonic on the DVX100 and the HVX. And I had these little boot camps that um, I used to do with under DVX user, which is a website I created and a little community. And I'd give these boot camps and I was, I'd always get feedback from um, Panasonic or somebody that, you know, we didn't include this feature, or we didn't do this feature because of the camera before it, or it's too good, or, you know, this legacy thing. So making Komodo, you know, this is something that we actually discussed early on. And we had this, we had this moto with the, with the, the red one obsolescence is obsolete. And a lot of people kind of took that as a, 
we're not, you know, we always let you upgrade and it's, you're going to have the same camera for the rest of your life, which of course is, is unrealistic, but it's, it really was a statement about not protecting a legacy. So when we were doing Komodo, I mean, it was with the DSMC two, you know, going from red one to DSMC two, you have to buy all new accessories and blah, 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 blah. For Komodo, it wasn't, okay, we have to use, we have to make the monitors work. It's not going to be good. It's going to take too much power. We're going to have to lower the capability of the camera, but we have to take care of that legacy. It's just something that, that you make a much better product. You see the, you know, obviously the RF mount, what didn't even exist when we started designing the Komodo. Uh, and when that came along, it was like, oh, you know, do we use our lens mount that we can change? Uh, or do we use this new mount that Canon create, not, you know, a competitor? Um, do we use that because it's better? It's better. You guys all know my, my campaign for a new mount over the last few years. And they just checked all the boxes. And it really was um, something that was important not to be able to say, okay, we kind of kind of reset, not look at the past, not look what we did. Same with batteries. I mean, we've been making our own batteries for since we started, you know, V-Locks, and then we have those stupid little red volts, which just kind of suck. The <laughs> intention was right, yes. but you know, we realized pretty quick, ah, we're not the best at making batteries. Um, so you know, along, we tested all the batteries. We tested the Sony batteries, the Canon batteries, Panasonic batteries, some third party batteries. And the Canon ones had enough amps to get us to where we could actually run the camera. And <clears throat> I said this um, earlier, but you know, my, my direction to the engineering was, you know, they're last, what do you need the camera to run for on these little batteries? And I said, one and a half hours. You know, that's the limit. And then uh, it's like, oh, Jesus, you know, that seems like a good minimum because those red volts on a, on a DSMC <laughs> one lasted yeah. for like 15 minutes. And you're just like, this is such a pain in the ass. It's nice to have as a hot swap if you have another battery and you take it off and then you can, you know, that little battery can act as just a hot swap. But beyond that, you don't want to get stuck out actually shooting with those things. So I kind of made the stretch saying, okay, an hour and a half, that's a great target. The and I was I was in I was saying for both. Like in my mind, I was like an hour and a half with two batteries on there. That's great. Our rock star engineers are like, oh, it's got to be an hour and a half each battery bay. So let's change everything, and and really work on this camera. And yeah, it took uh, it took a little bit extra time, but suddenly we got three hours on two of these little Canon batteries, which is. I mean, you know, most of the other little little cameras in this field, you know, you're if you're not overheating, you're lasting. It's minutes. You're measuring in minutes. Um, so that was a that was a nice little achievement, but it all kind of relied on Canon making these great batteries. And those batteries are phenomenal. They really are. And there's no weird like, oh, it's Canon. We have to have our own logo on it, just like Kipper Tie you know, you make in your mount or full control, like it doesn't have to be ours. It's like, what's the best solution? Let's ask them if we can do it and, and go forward because it's the best. If you just look at your, this as a customer and all of you would probably have the exact same reaction. If you didn't work for a company and said, okay, you get to build your own little camera, what parts would you do? It would probably be a collection of different things from different manufacturers. So, that's what we went all in. Same with media. Um, you know, we went all in with just let's choose what the best at the time is for the camera. And that's kind of what you see. And I have no problem looking at my camera and seeing, you know, the Canon adapter on the front, Canon batteries on the back, because I love Canon. Canon's done a great job to our to our entire industry for years. And they're coming back strong now. They were sleeping for a little bit. Um, but they're coming back with a vengeance and I love what they're doing. And I've been a Canon glass shooter for my entire life. So, you know, I've all, you've seen, I've made the Raven had all you could have was a Canon mount on it. Yep. Um, so, you know, I like to say, Hey, let's just choose the best. And Canon's got some really nice stuff they're working on right now with, with this entire new infrastructure. And 
this world has changed where trying to do this all independently, not a good idea anymore. We, you know, all our little camera groups have to come together and, you know, help each other out. So no, the, the specialization is, um, you know, is a, is a really big deal. Um, I wanted to, um, just to make sure I don't get totally off track. Um, Stop me if I'm talking too much. Stop me, please. I will, just... you, I will let you talk until you say something you shouldn't. You know, <laughs> <laughs> probably already um, have. I know you're waiting uh, for that. Yeah, um, Michael, can you? Um, there's something really obvious to anybody who's used uh, full control. Um, just looking at the screens we've got up either side of you there, um, which is you know the one thing that it really, really needed before, and it has now, which is we actually can see the picture. Um, what else is different? What else is new with the way that's set up for Komodo? Because I know, um, you know, you've had to... Yeah, what, what, what's, work. what's different first is that the camera now has a Wi-Fi antenna, which it didn't have before except the Ranger. So it makes the, the Wi-Fi much more uh, robust and you can change that antenna, put a bigger one. And you also have 5G networks now, 2.4 and 5G. Oh so, yeah. There's the antenna. Yeah. <laughs> That was a <laughs> so that's that a, big, a change in development. Yeah, yeah. So, so that's a, bi a big change I, uh, in terms of uh, reliability of the the Wi-Fi connection on set. And I hope I haven't tested like very far, but it looks like it's much more robust than what we had before, just with that uh, small antenna. And then and just transit to that. So obviously, if you're familiar with full control, it looks familiar, but it's different. It's all uh, <clears throat> square based. So because the, the camera was a little uh, square, I thought that I reshuffle the UI and let the user also change the, the, the user interface. So they're able to uh, <clears throat> change the buttons. And obviously, since we have this video preview, we needed to have like a landscape mode. So you can have the same uh, user interface in landscape mode. And if you click on the, uh, the image, it will go uh, full screen. And from there, you can just shoot with that as a monitor, even though it's uh, as a bit of latency, it's still uh, quite usable as a, as a short monitor. And if you uh, double tap on there, you'd still get some uh, control on the side while you're uh, on, in landscape mode. So if you want to keep your phone on your camera, you can use all the app. You don't have to go back vertically at any time. You can go into a, a menu, you can control your focus. Everything will be... Uh, working in both directions. So I go back to the vertical mode. And what I added, because like if you don't want to have the, the iris there, or if you don't want the ISO, or you prefer to have a different layout, then it will be possible to uh, just double tap on a button and assign something else. So let me just show you quickly. You have like different pages with some buttons that are set up, but uh, nothing is uh, permanent. So if I just like double tap there, it will pop a list with all the, the button that the app and the firmware uh, can display. So this will evolve as uh, Red adds more feature in the, uh, in the camera, there will be more uh, stuff, but you have different styles of showing the battery or different uh, thing you can search. Uh, ob obviously there's a search there. So if I'm looking for some lens tool there, you can type lens and it will like filter that and let me just get the iris and I double tap and now I've got the iris uh, there. And then any button can be just without opening the menu, you can just like slide up and down and we will change uh, live. And you can al also yeah, uh, open the, the menu like you did before and change your value like this. Let me go back up. So the, the whole app is now fully uh, user custom. You can customize everything you you want if you don't like the, the layout and you have like the same feature that you had before in full control for focusing where you can like put some marks and ask the, uh, the app to uh, rack focus so it can do it slowly or with different curves and different, uh, yeah. It's, I had the opportunity to work from the ground up and make a new version of my app. So since I was a better programmer uh, now that I was five years ago, I took the opportunity to <laughs> add features and, and see what we could, uh, we could do. So yeah, it's the, the same thing. You have the whole menu, you have uh, focus control, but I added stuff like uh, iris control now with the wheel. So you can also put some marks on your iris and do some uh, rack iris uh, change if you want with your EF lenses. And 
we have stuff for LEDs also, where you can preview your LEDs and let's apply a LED on the on the stream. So now my image is in black and white. And if I go there in full screen, you can trigger the autofocus from the uh, from the screen. I mean, I'm trying to uh, replicate as much as you would be able to do without access to the camera. An interesting point, I know this is me being a geek, is that um, obviously remote from the camera can mean really remote, can't it? Yeah, because, uh, but it, that's possible also with the, uh, the previous generation of camera, but if you just take your uh, camera, put it on your router, then if you open the ports uh, from the outside going into your own network, you can control the camera from anywhere else. So. On the DSMC one, you just or DSMC two, you have to open one port to be able to control the camera. Now you have to open two ports to be able to get the video feed and the and the camera. And you can have like multiple camera in a studio and being able to control each of one individually from the outside if if you want. To. And it's not um, it, it it doesn't um, have to be a single point to point connection. I mean, obviously, I know the camera's only got a certain amount of horsepower and a certain amount of bandwidth to feed stuff. But if you need one person to look at one thing, somebody else to look at something else, it's possible to connect more. Yeah, than that, uh, I'm not sure yet uh, if it will be the case with the Wi-Fi because on the DSMC uh, cameras, you just can have one connection at a time with Wi-Fi, but you can have up to eight and uh, gigi. I don't know at the moment, it's a, I'm able to connect two or I haven't tried much more, but uh, you can connect several devices, but I don't know with the video stream what's happening there and if it will stay in the... Yeah. You know, I was asking um, Mikhail whether we could just give uh, one device to the AC and the other device to a director that's just on, on set and, um, you know, that'd be fantastic. I mean, there, there's a, I think the point is that there is, there's clearly going to be a lot of scope for this stuff. Yeah. Uh, it, you know, the fact that the camera is set up to um, provide the feed, you know, and to provide external control. Yeah, that's um, we're right at the very beginning of that journey, I guess, right now. Um, and there's going to be a lot of scope for that. To, yeah, the, that the film you've, done, you've, done a, you've done a great job because I, I haven't used the app and I've used full control before. It feels so very much integrated with Komodo. It feels like it's being built from the ground up. So it, it feels on the on the shoot I did with London, I didn't have the app. So all I, all I was working with was uh, a very tall um, assistant, Bryce. Um, and, there's uh, there's and one. A, oh, sorry. An EVF. Sorry. And all I had was an EVF. So it was tricky. <laughs> when I when I used the app, it was just to blow me away. Yeah. The, yeah, it's real. Just to demonstrate how much of a machine this man is, the yeah. backstory to any show, he just showed it uh, briefly there, the LUT manager. There was. Um, when there was the frame IO had this thing on Sunset Boulevard here in LA when they were kind of demoing, it was a little intimate group of people that they were demonstrating their to the cloud service that they've been working on and, uh, and uh, LUTs were a big part of it and this real time kind of, you know, shoot to edit, uh, some really cool stuff that they're doing. And I remember going to the parking lot and thinking, because you're kind of limited on what you can store on a DSMC2, mm. on the on the Komodo, we have much more memory. So I text Uday, who's in charge of our engineering, and I'm like, how many LUTs, how much room can you give me for LUTs? Because we're going to need a lot of them. And he's like, oh, you can have 180. And I'm like, oh, 180? That's good he's like 180,000 and I'm like oh, <laughs> okay but immediately I'm like nobody's going to put 180,000 LUTs in their camera but you could have a lot where it starts to get really really confusing and I'm like holy shit how are we going to manage manage this the next text from the parking lot was the Mikhail saying hey we should think about making a LUT manager you know maybe it's a separate app or maybe it's something da 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 and, uh, you know, I, I think I got the, uh, well, let me think about it. Went back into the frame IO thing, went home. By the time I woke up, he had a video. He sent me a video of inside full control, this LUT manager. 
And I was like, holy shit. <laughs> like, this literally was eight hours later. And I'm like, man, this guy is just incredible. And you can see that, you know, see how powerful that is to have that community there because he was solving the problem um, that as a shooter uh, he needed to do. I saw it as a, you know, ex with this frame IO thing and that stuff just happens. And as, as fast and fluid as red is, and as awesome as our company stays nimble, there would be 15 meetings on, you know, what is a LUT manager? Why do we need it? Da, 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 check all the boxes. Who's in charge of it? Blah, 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 blah. Whereas this way, and I know it's the same, same as you guys, you know, with the long take, Hey, you know, we got a client that needs a two terabyte thing. It's like, dude, I can't do it. It's going to take me four years to test that and get that out. And he's like, oh, you want me to do it? John, John asked it. I'm like, yeah, sure. Go ahead. Well, should I ask for permission? I'm like, dude, you just got it. Go, go running. And, you know, very quickly. I mean, you guys obviously took your time and tested it properly. Yeah, yeah. And, but it, uh, different thing, you know, there's different scales of organization. And you guys, uh, Red, are in that intermediate zone yeah. <laughs> i'm still on the cowboy from california i don't care and i don't listen to anything and i'm just locked in my little stage here doing stupid stuff uh but the other side of red absolutely is a very process driven because you have to be you know this is everybody needs to be in this organization and march to the the beat of the drum and we meet in the middle literally it, yeah. and it's a beautiful thing because we get to bypass when it's important and when it's not and the stuff i'm not good at kind of happens and you know i'm sure it's happens with you guys too to smaller not with mikhail because he's there doing it all himself but um it's it's the same kind of thing and it's such an easy thing to lose it's such an easy thing for a company as you start growing uh to just turn off the let's not talk to the customer directly let's not do this let's be more process driven and you know it's more profitable probably but um it has to follow the traditional development timeline and everything else associated with it and you know we're just fortunate where we get this kind of you know dual-sided benevolent dictatorship where we can you know change the important things for you guys because you guys have family and i tell this to my staff I spend more time with the customers, with my customers, with our customers than I do with our staff. And I don't think that'll ever change. And um, I think it's important, but you have to have both. You know, you yeah. can't just you can't just have one side or the other. And we we're in a good groove now where we have that we have that balance. Yeah, I mean, the, the third party program uh, from our perspective, um, I like the fact that uh, there are portions of that which hold us to account. Um, because a good proportion of what we want to do, it, you know, we want to make sure that we're providing quality. We want stuff to be really good um, because a lot of the time, you know, the reason that we might start a concept process is that we're not satisfied with the status quo and it's no good just saying, okay, well, here's a half baked solution. Uh, if we're going to offer it for sale, if we're going to use it ourselves, I want it to be bang on. So the more formalized kind of third party um, process that we've got with you guys now, yeah, I like the fact that I can say, I've got this idea and um, you know, what the guys really want is, well, write that up for me, show me how you really mean to do it. Um, yeah. Get us prototypes, show us things. Um, and a lot of the time, you don't know whether you've got an idea right until you have to explain it clearly to someone else. Um, yep. And to the point where you can clearly express it and it's a fully formed idea, um, you know, it, it's actually helped our process a lot as well. Um, you know, I mean, the the speed that we're able to do stuff because we're really small. So, I mean, the um, this uh, RF to PL revolver, um, you know, in terms of getting an initial, an initial prototype made, you know, we... we from the point where I finished working on the um, the first round of the CAD to having something in my hands was like three days. You know, we have we work with prototyping companies. We have our own CNC guys um, very close to us. Yeah, we can make stuff happen really fast. But the iterations that we want them to go through and that we work with the guys at Red to go through mean that um, you know, everything just gets 
drilled down and refined that bit better. Um, and it was interesting. Just recently, I did a bit of a um, little bit of in-house training with uh, one of our staff members, um, basically going through how we design some of that stuff. Um, and there are several steps along the way where I would look at it and go, okay, what we've got to now is a functional component. It does the thing that it needs to do. And a lot of people would leave it there. Um, <laughs> but that's, as far as I'm concerned, it's 20% done at that point. If it works and that's all it does, we're maybe 20%. Um, it's got to feel right. It's got to look right. It's got to, you know, it's got to have all of the right qualities. Um, so yeah, it's, that's, it's another part of sticking to what you're good at. Um, yeah. Yeah, and support, and it and it reflects, and I love that the that the the gauge of that success comes from the community. I mean, if you make a shitty thing, you're going to get beaten up, and we've done that a lot over the years. And you have to know what to make and what not to make. It's one of the reasons that Matt and I started GDU, um, mm. because you know Red has to make accessories for such a diverse kind of market and you have the risk of actually not making something really good for anyone because it has to kind of work for everybody um and that can be said about a lot of things so you know we we always both of us shoot all the time and we're like i need a handle or i need this thing or i want to go let's just make it for ourselves and we literally inside states you know we have the let me see that we have the bridge port there. I don't yep. know if I'm going. We got CNC up there. All the GDU stuff is, I'm pointing that way. This is a horrible demonstration. But there's a big <laughs> military tent there where all the where all the GDU stuff is assembled. And you can move so fast, um, so fast when you're just doing it yourself and you have the capability to do it yourself and you go through prototype, the prototyping phase is the, the, the best, the best part of the speed. And then that's awesome. But then to say, okay, we made this little thing then give it to red and say, Hey, can you test this? You know, put it through environmental and all the cool stuff that Aaron and his manufacturing team can put it through. Roja and through environmental and the heat booth and the, you know, the stress testing and all the little machines is awesome to have both. And we give that kind of to you guys where you get the idea, you make the prototypes just like we do here. And then we help you that, that end mile saying, okay, give it to us. We'll test it for you. We'll make sure that the electronics is not going to blow up cameras I don't under, there's still a lot of people that just bypass that step for some reason. Um, but for you guys, I think it's very valuable because it's that nice little, it's not the important st step at all, but that verification and just that vote of confidence that, oh, we're not going to harm the camera or harm our product and it's going to fit is, is great. And, yeah, you know, of course we don't charge you guys for any of that. It's not that expensive to test your stuff, but I think that it's it's something unique that again, without you guys on this call, we could have never done. We got lucky because the three guys, three or four guys that I started the third party program mm. with, half of you on this call, knocked it out of the park. Trust me, if if we chose some of the other guys and it was just a bunch of, you know, cameras starting on fire and things blowing yeah. up that third party program probably would have ended really quick yeah that, that could have got wound up very quickly i mean yeah. the, an, an interesting part of it for me is that you know we've all come to it from um you know from the camera side and from the creative side you know but mikhail's not a coder i'm not a 3d designer i'm not a product engineer you know we've all got enough skill to make our way through that process and get something done and you know i'm eternally thankful that we live in a time where it is possible to you know to just download the right software connect with the right prototyping process you know that stuff is accessible to us um but yeah if, if i was just an industrial designer by trade 
um, you know, we wouldn't, this, this stuff wouldn't exist. It wouldn't work. Yeah. Um, it has to come from the heart. It has to come from what you, uh, what you actually need. Um, I have a couple of questions that I just want to um, ping back at people. Um, so we have a couple of people asking about um, ND with Revolver, whether it's different having ND behind the lens or ahead of the lens. Um, there's a good reason for having glass behind the lens. In a lot of cases, it is beneficial, but it's got to be high quality. You put poor quality glass behind the lens and you screw your image very fast. Um, but there are long lenses out there where you know the opposite is true. You might find that um, you know there are always exceptions with optics. Um, I think the, the whole point for us is that we provide an option. And I guess, you know, I mean, Gerald, I, I appreciate your input on that, but I mean, obviously lots of people over and over will say, where's the, where's the internal ND? Why isn't it there in the camera? Um, my take on it is if that was there in the camera, you're stuck with it. You get what you're given um, and you're inherently making a compromise before you even start. Um, you know, when you get to choose, um, just like you would choose a lens, um, you know, you get that flexibility back. Absolutely. And it's, it's the same thing with the, with the mount, you know, the interchangeable mount, which we did with all the way back to the red one. Mm -hmm. Um, I think before anybody really did it and it's that flexibility, you know, the modular aspect, even though their called moto isn't that modular since that plan step is so, so short you can have you can afford that and and the biggest the biggest benefits you know you also have to to worry about size of camera and yeah we could have put an internal nd in there but the camera would have had to grown and this camera had a very very specific requirement for size where we just couldn't do that and for a lot of people it it's not a requirement for the way that they're using the camera so the best solution is if I need it, hey, call you guys and offer the solution. And it's and again, it's just like you saw with those internal uh, OLPFs that we made. Uh, you guys did it better. You guys did your version of that better than we did because you're specialized in that and you're specific and you have way more time. You know, when we're making 500 SKUs on different products. We yeah. only have so many people that we can focus and spend the time on OLPS until that engineer has to go off and, you know, worry about something else where you guys can kind of carry along that path. And yeah, we, 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 can, we get to live and breathe one little component of the system. Yeah. Um, and yeah, I mean, I, I would um, be very, reticent to try and take on an entire camera system that's it, it seems unfathomably complicated to me when i know how much effort we put into like a section of the process um and yeah it does like you say it means we can do uh you know we can really refine stuff and we can pay really close attention to it um absolutely and and then that's you know that really is the i think that's the best of it's as close to a community product as you co could possibly get when everybody has their hand in stuff, especially the, it's why I, I, I released the mechanical dimensions of the Komodo before even the camera specs, mm. you know, that was on purpose. And I own an accessory company and a camera company and that I would, you know, I'm giving away this information to potential competitors. Um, but that's not what it's about. Cause I know you guys will make better stuff than we can and stuff we didn't even think about and you'll see that now as the komodo get closer to normal production and you're seeing it every day now there's all these accessories coming out from a lot of people where in the past back up 10 years we kept that stuff you know we were horrifically protective about that stuff we wouldn't give even bolt locations until after we were shipping the camera and that was wrong, you know, then everybody has to play catch up and the shooters suffer because they get this brand new camera and there's nothing that works for it yet. And it's not a good experience. So I love that I'm seeing a whole bunch of different companies, both good and both bad, come out with accessories for Komodo before anybody can actually do it because you have time. You have 3D models of Komodo out there where people are printing on their 3D printers and testing this stuff and i think that's awesome i yeah, think I mean, it's, it's I rad say, 
you know, uh, at our own scale at Kepitai as well, um, I would really want to do my best to emulate that uh, because, again, you know, we, there are things that we don't, you know, we know we don't do well. And, um, you're, or, you know, places where the economics are, you know, we make stuff here in the UK. Um, the economics don't work the same when you're making stuff in other parts of the world. Um, you know, so, you know, I would definitely encourage other um, manufacturers, other accessory companies, you know, it makes sense for us to collaborate on stuff. You know, if you make a bracket and I make a different bracket and they could, you know, make together and play well, why yeah. not? You know, we're, not, we're, we're just helping each other. You know, we, we've turned that into a sale for each of us, not a sale for only one of us and the other guy's part didn't fit. Um, Absolutely. Absolutely. So, yeah. Um, no, I love it. And, and we're definitely following that down to every, I mean, even, you know, we made our own custom rosette pattern back in the day. And, you know, we've changed over, you know, to the stand because it's like, why add the difficulty, you know, why add the complexity? It's just not worth it. Yeah. A um, couple of other questions, things coming in, I'll, I'll just to ping to you, Jared. Um, the shallow flange depth on the on the camera means obviously the sensor is a little closer to the action than it has been in the past. Um, in terms of cleaning the sensor, cover glass, that kind of stuff, um, how accessible is that, especially given we don't have an interchangeable LPF that you could whip out and and clean? Um, how are you finding that? It's, it's actually, you know, the red one was horrific. <laughs> <laughs> but it's on the Komodo, it's it's much easier to actually get in there and clean because of the shallow flange depth. You can actually, without taking before with the DSMC 2, and you, you'd have the mount on there. And yeah, you could take the mount off and you're kind of really close to the center and you can clean it. Um, but a lot of times, you know, if you're on set and you're shooting, you don't have a lot of time, you just take the lens off and you're sticking down a little port trying to get that little booger off the, yeah, yeah exactly, with the thing. Um, that shallow flange, that, I mean, it gives you opportunity, of course, to get it more dirty um, or dirtier, but you also have, it's very easy to, I don't know if you've tried it yet, but to take a swab and yeah. let's go down. Because that cover glass is so close, uh, to the front, you, you're not digging in and you can see and you have visibility. So I, I think it's actually better uh, in a lot of ways. Yeah, no, I, I agree. I mean, it's um, a, another aspect of that. We get asked about it quite a bit with uh, with the filtration in, uh, in the revolver cartridges. Uh, people saying, oh, well, you know, isn't there going to dust going to get in? Are you going to have issues with um, with cleaning? I mean, the yeah, what we try and point out is that a piece of glass that is uh, e easily cleaned is far better than a piece of glass that stays away from dirt because yeah. the dirt will get there somehow. Um, you know, and with these Absolutely. these things, you know, I it makes people cringe, but I would quite happily rub those on my shirt. You know, the coat <laughs> on the glass means that it just comes straight off. Um, yeah. Obviously, you know, there are some restrictions on how you might do that, but I still kind of stand by that philosophy. I, I would much rather have... Uh, optical elements that you can clean safely and easily than have something, you know, an enclosed locked down system where you can't get at it in the hope that it won't get dirty. Because, I mean, and, uh, the way that people want to use Komodo, I'm sure they're going to get really dirty. Everyone's had an experience of uh, not being able to clean their EVF because they can't get into the optics. Yep. <laughs> yep. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> and trust me, that as sealed as that thing was, stuff is going to get in there i mean it's yeah. the world we live in even on you know very clean sets it's just that dust and you have you know you have electro you have ef too that's that's attracting dust particles to these things you know um so it's going to find a way there so let's just make it so you can get at it really quickly and 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 for the most part uh everything on on komodo is kind of accessible like that which is good so yeah. in terms of um accessorization with with komodo obviously there are um 
there are ports, uh, some of them super obvious, some of them hidden away. Um, there's a lot of speculation going on there. Are we um, likely to, uh, I mean, I, I asked this question knowing half the answer. Um, a lot of that stuff is going to be accessible for third parties once the protocols, once the plans are fully implemented. Um, what's, Absolutely. what's your vision in terms of, um, uh, you know, right now people are using, you know, small HD monitors, you know, whatever they, they might have. Um, with Mikhail's software um, on a, you know, on a mobile device, do you see that becoming like a, a totally integrated regular part of the process or um, what's, where do you think the balance is going to go for most people? It, yeah. Oh, great question. I think that the flex, the capability of that little, um, those top pins, are they're not just a monitor pass through and power like it was on the DSM C2. The capability there is, is, pretty incredible and i think you know we make a lot of cameras for other companies for really crazy applications that some are pop like the facebook big ball camera um and some that are private and we get to put a lot of these cameras together and network them together and i'm not a, a vr guy at all but i understand you know computational imaging and i'm a big fan of that and linking these cameras together so there's you know there's a big part of that in terms of monitoring you know there we have that little monitor on the top and it's actually surprised it's a it's a great monitor on on the top with a high resolution and it's surprisingly more useful than i thought it would be so just alone as the camera camera once we have autofocus actually working you can use that as a finder, just like, you know, when, you know, and there's no, there's absolutely no mistake on, you know, where this camera, if you look at a medium format camera, it's kind of looks the same. And you had a very big image with this little finder on the top. I really like the potential of what that does. But when you start adding monitors like the small HD, and all the others that's another example of what we just talked about is other people doing better than we can and you know yeah we made monitors for the dsmc2 and the red one but holy shit they're expensive and not as good as something that you look at a company like um a lot of these monitor companies and that's all they do you know you have the Atomus, you have the you have the small HD, you have the port key, you have all these things that are that's all they do every day is make monitors. And that just works. And you have to because there's not enough power to cut from the from the camera to power all that stuff. So the capabilities for monitoring is there. And then you have, you know, you got nor like the handle, you know, this is the red handle with the little button where it uses the pins, very basic. Um, but then you have the Komodo link, which I don't think anybody's really seen before, but you have this thing with the USB port there that connects to the pins and it opens up, um, a lot of potential, not just for the obvious stuff of like dumping off your recording to an external USB C drive, but you can start using USB specific ethernet adapters or connecting devices and it just kind of expands and the protocol inside the camera is it's the it's one of the one of the and i'm focused still i think i just screwed yeah, you're, you're good. um <laughs> the, i think that the it's one of the great things that we actually got from the hydrogen program even though we were completely separate companies is we kind of made that made some of those relationships which gave us the ability to leverage the cell phone industry and csi and some of the protocols um to get into the camera and do a lot of really cool things with with data and with connecting these these cameras that we're going to rely on third parties more than we ever had before we don't want to do everything ourselves because there's companies like everybody on this call 
that do something better than we could because we would be learning from ground from the beginning um so why not let everybody else do it so yes we we definitely will be letting that protocol out we don't obviously want to do it too early because it's changing every day and we don't want people you know that's the big and i know it drives you crazy (laughs) is you know is that you're like what's this what's that what does this port do what does this pin do and it's like well it's changed six times in the last five weeks so I don't want people working on stuff in their own little bubble and then realizing, oh crap, red just completely changed everything and all my work for the last six months <laughs> that I couldn't talk to you about or you couldn't tell me about gets thrown down. So it's finding that balance of of what, but for the basic stuff, um, you know, like I said, the mechanical stuff and most of the pinouts, you know, the EXD port pinouts and, and the power pinouts and all the other stuff uh, we released before, way before the camera. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Uh, Fernie, can you just um, uh, switch over to, the, I know you've got a view there, we can take a look at the top of the camera actually. Just, yeah. just um, uh, take a little closer look at things there. Um, cheers. So one of the things that, um, that I found quite interesting working with that screen was that um, despite its size, it's actually much more usable than um, than you think it's gonna be. Um, it is actually pretty practical. Um, in terms of, uh, I don't know if you wanna um, talk on this one or not, there are obviously lots of features that are not here yet at this point. Uh, right now, we don't have a punch in on that um, output to go one-to-one. Yep. Um, and I know it's been a bugbear for a lot of people, how that behaves. You know, we all have super high expectations coming from some other, you know, devices that don't have such a long legacy. You know, we want to just kind of go, oh, show me everything. Show yep. me everything. <laughs> you know. <laughs> so give, um, me some, give me some good news. I love, no, all of that stuff. And, you know, I posted on Red User this, and you guys are actually interrupting uh the interface meeting uh that i'm supposed to be having right now but you know i and what i said on red users was this is a work in progress and there was a lot of stuff that uh was a little bit janky and didn't work but we front-ended the or front-loaded the development of this camera on this has to work what the camera was intended to we need to put this on set as a crash camera or a utility camera or a DE camera and just turn on, press record and, you know, have the SDI feed out and be as stable as, as possible. So all the other stuff like interface, like anamorphic D squeeze, um, the punch in and, you know, even the meters, we've changed so much since that, Wish I could show you my build versus your build, but um, the we've changed so much about that already. It's driving me crazy. But it's it's one of those work things where I call it the fuzzy stuff. It's the important stuff, and especially for a lot of the market that's coming in from, you know, the mirrorless or the lower end that's looking at this camera. Uh, all that stuff has to come, but it's not cemented. This is another, that's why I gave it to the community and the feedback as I don't know if anybody's seen that thread, but people actually went in and created entire camera UIs. And I was like, holy shit, you guys with some really great ideas. And it's like, you know, we would never, I'm not going to think of most of that stuff. The engineers aren't going to think about that stuff. It just helps things move so fast. So a lot of the things and a lot of the complaints or I guess lack of, of features definitely will come. We're just working on stability as number one because this camera, you know, it, there's, this camera's out and Matrix just got back um, in action again. And re- we got a lot, we have a lot of really big movies that these cameras are on right now shooting. And the last thing they want is a bunch of the, you know, I want autofocus to work and I want this and that. And where's my, you know, little Mickey Mouse menus. And they just want it to be reliable. And so that's kind of the approach we're taking is make it reliable because you can bring in all the fun stuff after, which we've done 
I mean, that's the history of red is the software keeps getting better and better. Um, you know, we weren't even supposed to have this, you know, it's another great thing. I hate saying great thing about COVID, but another silver lining of COVID is this, mo this wireless monitoring came way quicker than we thought it was going to be uh, possible to get done. So we're adding that kind of stuff. And then, of course, handing over to Mikhail, who at the time when we turned it on, I don't even think he actually had a camera on with him. Yeah. And he figured it out without having a camera to test it on. I'm <laughs> just like, holy crap. And that, I mean, talk about rewards. I mean, he got a camera, I think, the next day or, or a few days after that one. But that's the kind of stuff that engineering as a as the collaboration is you guys get to say hey i really hate those new exposure meters or i hate those you know audio meters there why aren't they over there we can change all that stuff that's probably the easiest things to change we're just working on the hard stuff right now so i know it's a pain in the ass but it, it will come <laughs> trust yeah, me I mean, honestly um you know I, i've worked with um early versions uh of your gear over the years um and you know i'm fairly well known for being that guy who will do horrible things and break stuff but yep. you know I'm, I'm, I'm not shy about pushing buttons and seeing what happens um it's why do you have a camera hard, you know it's pretty hard to break i have to say and it's uh it's really you know had the same feedback um you know fernando using it as well yeah it's yeah it, it may be that at the moment things are relatively simplistic however yeah it's just been working it doesn't feel like we're um you know at a super early stage in that sense um yeah, yeah the know. epic the epic has no had no playback for a year or two or so a year and a half or something and <laughs> yeah. here you have here you have playback already that's super fast and toggles very quickly so yeah hopefully yeah. thing will come and be yeah. surprising again with new features yeah, no, we're we're excited because it is it is an entirely new platform for us. So we and a new sensor, so we get to explore and dig in and the capabilities are really, you know, as cliche as it is, limited only by imagination because this camera can do a lot of really cool stuff, which will help, you know, DSMZ3 and all the cameras in the future because this gives us so much more horsepower. I think we milked, um, obviously we milked what the capabilities of the DSMC2 were. And, you know, you have to, we have to start taking it out resolution choices and, you know, stuff that, because the, the, the memory was full, you know, we had to start taking stuff out to put new stuff in. And there's a certain point where you just have to stop. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Karen, I'm super impressed how quiet the camera is as well. Yeah, um, you strip stuff out, but it's so. I mean, it, it's. It, I've had it shooting in just in quiet mode for for like all the time. It has adaptive as well. I can barely hear it, um, even on a, on a hot day. Yeah, that's uh, you know, and it, it's of course that used to be. There's a lot of things that we get, you know, skin tone. A lot of things is crazy that Komodo is the one that fixes all of this stuff. Um, Fan speed was a big one that you always hear. All oh, the fans are so hot. The audio guys hated us. It's so loud in Komodo or in, uh, sorry, our previous cameras. And same with skin tones. Skin tones are so bad. What's going on? Um, you know, I, I, whatever X camera, Airy or Sony or, well, usually not Sony, but always compared to somebody in skin tones. And Graham did such an incredible job with the color science on Komodo. Uh, really i mean that's one of the and i know people are talking about it and it's i love it because it's with the worst footage that's out there from komodo it's, it's some of the best skin tones this camera's ever seen and and i know a lot of people a lot of people that are that know what they're looking at is like oh my god what just happened because finally they nailed it and there's a lot of the okay you nailed it on a lot of those things fan speed being one of them and it's all, you know, it's all relative to finding the best solution. It's why that, that fan exhaust to the left. And it's like, oh, my God, why did you guys, ex why is the exhaust blowing in my face? Well, your camera gets to run a lot 
quieter when it does that. So you make, I made the decision. I personally made that decision. You're not supposed to shoulder mount this fucking camera anyways. I don't know how many times I have to say that. I know people will, but trust me, people that are using the camera as it was designed to are going to appreciate that. Wow. It's quieter and it runs cooler and not even just that it's more stable in that temperature and the calibrations are more expanded. So the calibrations you actually last on a much wider temperature scale too. Um, and that's all connected and you have to make those decisions on overriding the obvious for something that always has been fairly or unfairly saddled with us for our entire, you know, camera building careers. Yeah. And, and those are the two biggest ones. Well, the fan one really never really personally bothered me that much. I know the skin tones bug Graham so much, um, always hearing that. And uh, there's a few other ones, some you've seen and some you haven't, that really lets us create this new platform, on this new platform going forward. Just getting rid of those things that people are like, oh, I wish it could do this, or I wish it didn't do that. So, yeah. I think it's important to say that the, uh, I'm pleased to see that the Black Shade, having done one, uh, only took a minute and a half. Yeah. So. <laughs> that's one of those, that's one of those things. And again, you just think, oh, it's just a faster processor in there. And it's not really that, you know, or there's more memory or there's no, it's, it, there's so many things that the engineer have to bring together. And that's from the sensor, the stability of the sensor, the, the way that the thermal is designed to actually, you know, ramp up and down and hold at certain temperatures. And, uh, you know, there's probably not a lot of people that do pottery in, um, this thing, but when you do oh, pottery, uh, you have a creative community. I, I think you might be yeah. surprised. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you get when you're when you're making pottery and you're and you you're firing in the kiln. You know, you're you you have these cone temperatures and it's confusing as fuck. But it's these little when you slow things down and when you cannot just heat up, but you can slow down the cooling. You get the stability that literally creates art and. It's very much the same inside the camera. When you have more control and more stability with that temperature, you can do black shading that's not these huge swings and it's fast and, and you can store more, but you don't really even need to. Um, but it's, yeah, uh, uh, it, it seems so simple, but man, is it a lot. The engineers really I, outdid themselves on, on this one. You get to kind of see all of our experience over the last 10 15 years kind of come down into this camera which is cool because it's such an accessible camera it really is like the red one in that aspect but what's fascinating it's smaller but it's uh, both faster and better in many aspects <laughs> so it's like a... it has all the fundamentals from from the you know dchn2 with ipv2 and it has it's just yep. a yeah, it's familiar, isn't it? I mean, that's um, yeah. another aspect. I know we've had, um, uh, I've had people asking about workflow um, and realistically, it's, uh, if you're a red shooter already, workflow with Komodo is a non-event. It's, it, there are 3D files. It's, uh, I have nothing more to say. It matches, yeah. it does all the things you think it's going to do. There's, yeah, it, it's a very short conversation, really, as far as workflow goes. Um, about the only thing that uh, obviously there's been a little bit of confusion around the, um, the change to HQ, MQ rather than uh, red code ratio specifically. Um, it feels to me like we're biasing to, right now at least towards some fairly high data rates, but yeah. you know, that's um, you know, out of the box uh, DS72 camera will default to A to one, which seems relatively low data rate compared to what Komodo is doing. I don't know if that's a conscious thing your end or- yeah. It, it definitely is. And, and you know, it's, it's not as simple as just three settings because it's kind of a table. And it's interesting because you kind of, and I've heard this, this discussion a lot, and they're like, oh, they're doing it because, you know, lower end cameras have basically low, medium, high. And, you know, this is the camera for low end people, so they need to simplify it. But it really wasn't, there's a few people that really understood red cute code values and when we started it was if you remember you know you had red code 24 and red code 36 and it actually 
it actually made sense you know you were because it started with you know megabytes per second it kind of lost that along the way but um there's a certain kind of and i noticed this even a lot when we started in this lockdown and we had these more interaction and live questions over these these solitary series video things we have people one of the questions that you just saw every five minutes was what red code should i use should i use 10 to 1 should i use 21 5 to 1 3 to 1 people were so confused over i mean people understood the goalpost to some degree but there were so many choices in between that really didn't you didn't need to have that granularity of dive in that deep it just made sense to simplify it uh into uh you know are you do you need to record it's the only reason you should select low quality is do you need to record for a very long time because you have a limited amount of cards or do you shoot really high quality the medium shouldn't even really be there um but you know people would probably revolt if we didn't but it's really the decision you know you want to extend the length or maybe if you're shooting something with not, not a lot of detail you can get away with with low for an extended time but again we're using on the on the dsmc to well, all our cameras in the past that use proprietary media that was fucking expensive now we're using these cfast cards which are pretty cheap in in comparison you should just be shooting on high quality all the time because you never know when you need to dig in and and grab especially stills you know stills is one of the big things to, to get from these um but you never know when you need it and it's really it's really affordable just to record at the best data rate as you possibly can Does that makes yeah sense? i mean media is to be perfectly honest um you know once you're into backing up storing it dealing with it it's still incredibly cheap at this point in time you know your price per terabyte you know if you do things the way we do for example these lto copies and so on it's still I mean, I was looking back um, to uh, a good few years back um, before this kind of um, revolution where we were shooting digi beta tapes and that kind of thing in the, the distant past. Um, you know, just literally a, a 30 minute um, tape is costing you more per minute than it does to run the whole process right now, including your backups and everything else. Um, yeah. So we've got spoiled, I, I think, to an extent, mm -hmm. but. Yeah, it's uh, it's really not a big deal to just burn through some more media. It, I know it creates you know some work, some administration, some process. Um, but honestly, the like you say, the utility of having um, you know all of that quality there if you need it. Um, I mean, God, we we have um, an outrageous archive of stuff that we've shot and you know we go back to it and we use it and the fact that it's there and in high quality and shot the best way we can is you know never fails to um you know to, to pay off yeah and you know like I, I showed you the usb port where you can just offload to a drive directly you don't even need a computer um you you know after you but you have it's so much easier you you know you talked about tape and I mean, forgetting about film for, you know, taking that out of the equation, you think about tape. And I remember, I still have a box of tapes in my garage. And I, you know, we reuse tapes because, you know, I can't even, they weren't that expensive. Some of them were, but you'd reuse them. And I go back and look at those every once in a while. And you know how you, you actually write on them what you shot. And then if you reuse them, which you really weren't supposed to do, but whatever, you'd cross it off and then you know tape over it and i look at some of those things like damn you know i wish i didn't tape over this you know you reuse this because man that was a cool thing and you know some of these people aren't around anymore and that would have been nice to have we're very spoiled now where you know even just taking a mag and offloading it and you know storing it on a really cheap hard drive we we kind of get we kind of get spoiled that ah, oh, you know, I wish, I wish we could just record forever and not worry about it. But I don't think you know it doesn't get better than 
consumer cards, fast consumer cards uh, with CFast and then offloading to a cheap drive. It's cheaper than it ever, especially with us, cheaper than it ever has gotten before. So when you have red code and you have the raw, which a lot of people understand just how good of a file that is, before, if you have an RGB codec that's compressed or even ProRes, you're kind of like, okay, maybe I, it's not as important. It's really important when you have the fidelity of that image in that red code format that you can dig in and go deep. So every, every bit of data that you can throw at it is going to help. So why not just shoot it all as much yeah. as you can? Just buy some hard drive. Yeah. yeah. Only took eight minutes to offload the, the media. Um, yeah. Okay. yeah it's not a big deal is it i mean the um for, for clarity i've had a couple of people asking about it the um that us uh, that usb c um that with, doesn't exist yeah doesn't exist <laughs> just by the way remember that indeed um i think um from the point you're, not of view of you're not recording to a drive while you're shooting no, is that no, the no. yeah this uh, this is I think what people are wondering about, because obviously there are some cameras out there which will let you access, uh, you know, a recordable stream by USB C. It's um, a really, it's a really interesting thing, and you can see. I mean, it's why we, it's, and I don't recommend it, but we tested it early on, and it's why you can, you know, we don't turn off the camera when you open the media door. There yeah. are C. The better way to do that is with the adapter that goes from CFast to um, to a drive, to an yeah. SSD. That's the better way to do it, but it's still, you're relying on high-speed cables and bumping it or bad connections or dirt. It's really, again, it's, it's the media is so cheap. I know it's expensive to a lot of people, but it's so much cheaper than we're all used to just record to that and then you know that USB C thing that we get we, that we're making will let you after you're recording offload off to a drive and then yeah. you know yeah. then you can reuse your card but there's you know even when we had C remember we started on compact flash cards mm -hmm. and there's productions that would buy hundreds of cards and just not record on them and it's the and literally put them in a vault and it's the cheapest thing they've ever done by, you know, buying cards and only using them once. It's it's that cheap where, you know, at that point, it's cheaper than tape, cheaper than film by a long shot. Um, and you just get to it's the beautiful world we live in where um, everybody else gets to push that push that technology forward and we just reap the benefits. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, the um, in terms of uh, off-board recording, like you say, there's um, having flexible cables in between is a sucky situation. We, yeah. you know, nobody wants that. Uh, and like you say, vibration is a, is another aspect. I mean, it's useful, I guess, for people to know that you know there are products out there. If you have a special situation, it's a SATA connection. It's not anything exotic. Yeah. Um, and you know, if you need a special solution. Yeah, I mean, I'm sure we'll probably look at something in the future, but it won't involve a flexible cable. Um, yeah. that, you know, that's that's the part of it that would that would definitely suck. Um, so um, I think we've probably eaten up a lot of your time, Jared. I'm, just, I'm, just <laughs> I'm so time. late for so many things. <laughs> yeah, I know. Well, we, we appreciate it a hell of a lot. Um, but I love you guys, really. Thank you for having me. This has been not great. Not at all. Not at all. Um, so um we kept hearing emails uh, during the the chat so maybe you have more cameras to yep, <laughs> to <replay> yep. To. <laughs> absolutely exactly. sorry i had to put my thing off but anyways thank you guys really like this group specifically you guys are i mean you're making this better not just for us but for the customers and i think everybody appreciates that it's really oh. important the work you're doing and i love it so oh, keep on you. doing it we, we shall. We'll do our best. And um, yeah, thank you, Mikhail, for joining us as well. Um, I think there's a strong possibility that we'll do a little more of this uh, in the near future, uh, where we'll dive into some more depth on uh, red control, full control, uh, and into some of our products as well around Komodo. 
Um, but for right now, given that Jared, we were able to get a bit of your time, uh, it was nice just to be able to shoot the breeze and uh, see how everything is looking. Absolutely. My pleasure, guys. Cool. All right. Stay Talk safe. You. Thank you. Bye-bye. Nice. Yes.